The last of our videos uh, is going to be focusing particularly on children. We're not going to deal with elderly because I think we've uh, picked them up before. I'm David Koenig, General Practitioner at the Royal College of uh, General Practitioners, and I'm in conversation with Peter Goadsby. Peter, headache in, in children, migraine in adults is unmet. Children is virgin territory, basically. Yeah, sadly that's true. It's, it's true. Uh, I think the definitive study was in Newcastle in, in 1965. 10.6% of children have migraine. That's quite a lot of, of children. We, we just published a study next that we looked at 1,500 school children, and 20% of them have headache that bothers them at least once a week. Wow. And half of those have, we did quality of life scores, have quality of, generic quality of life scores worse than, than children with diabetes and asthma. So it's wow. 10 to 20% of children, a lot of problems. Yes. Um, why, we've talked a little bit about why, why adults don't present. Why do children not present with headache, do you think? Well, I think that there are multiple re reasons for that. I think part of it is, again, in the family, that it's, it's, you know, we have headache in our family, what are you complaining about? I think there's an assumption in, in children very often that there's some other ulterior motive for their headache. They're trying to avoid school, avoid something or other. Um, and that a, 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 a significant problem like migraine is the last thing that's thought of. Right. Whereas probably in, you know, you just, it's pretty alarming to think the number of mm. children have a problem. And as you say, somewhere between six and 10% of the paediatric adolescent age group have got migraine. So um, quite a few of these must be migraineurs. Do you think headache in children sits more within a biopsychosocial framework than adults? I mean, I get the, the sense that it, it, they're more susceptible with stress and anxiety in, in their schooling, different difficult times of life for them, and, and this does compound the problem. Do you think that's a fair assessment? I think, I think perhaps adults don't recognise that dimension more than children have more of it. Right. I, I, I think that... I actually think that, I mean, you're right, that there's a, they're in a particular time, they've got their particular stresses. But, you know, in the world we live in, um, that's true of adults as well. And what adults would like to think of themselves as being slightly more rational. I'm not sure that... I'm not sure that... So I, I turn it around and agree with you, but from, a, from another perspective. Right. And one of the problems is making a diagnosis in children. I mean, mm. the, the database, we did a big database study, and over 80% of children that present with headache do not have a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Now, it's far more difficult in children than in ad 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 adults. It's usually fairly straightforward. Mm -hmm. But in children, they don't develop their clinical picture very often, do they? There's, there's a very mixed picture. Tension up. It doesn't fit into one or the other. You have to, have to change your diagnostic thresholds. Could you just say a little bit about... Mm. What's going on there, do you think? Are they just maturing into, into migraine? Are they getting both migraine tension and headache? What, what, what's happening? Well, I mean, you know, you look at a child and you look at an adult and they both look human, but most of us could tell the difference between a child and an adult. A uh, child's less well-developed. And migraine is less well-developed in children. It would seem the attacks are shorter, they're less featureful, they tend to be more bilateral. I mean, it's, it's, it tends to be uh, less well-developed, but then, you know, that, that's what children are less well developed. Um, I find in uh, childhood headache it useful to get the, get the bigger picture. So as you were saying earlier, the family history is really important. If mum's got migraine and you know a sister and grandmum's got migraine and the child's coming along with a tr troublesome headache, well, I mean, you know, their biology, mm. they've got a sporting chance if they just tossed a coin, 50% chance of having mum's genes at any rate. So family history is terribly important. That's where I think the triggering thing becomes very useful. Um, trigger, sorry, sort of features of the attack. So uh, the, the premonitory phase can be quite useful. So getting the, uh, the other range of the information, the parent will say, well, he's, he changes his mood. Gets, mm. that's, you see that in adults, but you've got the parents reporting it. Um, you get these tiredness changes or the passing more year and the craving thing. Those migrainous premonitory symptoms become more useful to pick up when the main headache features aren't there. And then again in triggering. So what's bringing them on? Well, he's, he doesn't have his lunch. Mm. Uh, he sleeps in mm. till th you know, 11 a.m. on a Saturday and gets a headache. Well, mm. big surprise. Uh, or, or he doesn't, or when his sleep becomes ir irregular, for example, or he gets them triggered with sport. Mm. So the uh, these things that are less important, so less crucial, so we say, to getting the diagnosis in the adult, mm. become more important because they're telling you the circumstances mm. and the biology of the headache that you're seeing. And I find so I find taking a little bit longer with the, the child and getting that dimension of the history actually sort of 
fleshes it out for you and makes it you, so you can make a positive diagnosis. But I, I get the sense that the children are more sensitive to changes and things. You know, they do miss the young girls do miss oh, their yeah. breakfast. They don't hydrate themselves yes. during school with drink. I mean, they're a little bit more. Their brains are, I guess, a little bit more sensitive to be triggered by by change. Exactly, and they're, so they're offering you a way. Uh, you know, in young girls, you, you see the you see the onset of these troublesome headaches about eleven or twelve, and you know, the, and the very next question is going to be about the onset of their. Uh, of, of their periods and uh, you know there's a there's a paint there's a picture you build up of the patient over time and that uh, helps and that helps a lot with the diagnosis. If we can move on to treatment now I mean it, it's very it runs very much in parallel to adult treatment doesn't it really yes. I mean you just treat them as young adults paracetamol um, and not aspirin if they're under 16 but ibuprofen uh, domperidone you can use I find that as a, a useful first step very similar to adults. Well young migraineurs and they're, they're, you know you treat them by you, you get their weight you mm do some dosage adjustments by weight, you know, based on a 70 kilogram adult, see what they weigh, adjust the dosage appropriately. Um, and and, uh, and the, the, it's a treatment of migraine. Yeah, and triptans licensed nasal spray over 12. Now this is not for safety concerns because there's such high placebo effects, up to 60% mm -hmm. in kids. Mm -hmm. Licensing studies were difficult to, yes. so there's no reason that you couldn't give a, give a child 12 and over 50 milligrams of sumatriptan orally. No reason at all. Uh, before you go into nasal spray, because they don't like nasal sprays very much. No, I think that, no, exactly. There's been quite a lot of off license use of oral triptans in adolescence uh, in the last, you know, 15 to 20 years. Um, and all of these things are, of course, a, about making a sensible decision. I find the rapid, uh, the rapid melt things, the, the Zolmi triptan mm. or the Riser triptan, helpful because they don't need the fine water. There's mm. nothing elaborate about it. They can have a single packaged one with them. It's only useful if they take it, so better mm. if they've got it. Um, less sort of in, in, invasive in their life. Um, and, and, you know, there, there's no particular. In 20 years after the introduction of triptans, there's no particular problem that's arisen mm. um, in this age group. And of course, they're not liable to the sort of things that, we're con that we were talking about earlier on yeah. that concern us with triptans yeah. anyway. The studies have been difficult um, related to placebo effects, um, and there are some design things that uh, are probably beyond the context of here, but I, I think that, they're, uh, that they have use in mm. this age group. And preventive medication indications, again, very similar. Mm. Similar armor material. I yes. tend to use pisotifen. I think pisotifen works really well in children. I don't know what your experience is. It works much better in kids than adults. And I always start with pisotifen. It seems to work extremely well. Well, I think it's, I think that um, it's, I think I'd agree with you that it's got more use in, in, in children. Uh, I'm not a big fan of it in young girls mm. who don't thank you for the for weight gain. Yeah. Uh, so I think in young girls, uh, maybe propranolol, uh, you know, beta blocker has a little bit going for it in that mm. in that context. In young uh, in in young boys, however, that I would agree with you, Pisotifen mm. is a good place to start very often. So propranolol, fine. Then amitriptyline, okay. And then I guess, although the evidence base doesn't support, there's no reason why they can't get an anti try an anti epileptic if you're really getting stuck. There is adolescent. There's an adolescent study now, randomised controlled trial for topiramate mm -hmm. um, in in migraine, and it was effective. So you could make an uh, you could make an evidence based argument. Uh, for the use of topiramate uh, even earlier than a, tri than a tricyclic because right. of the, the data now. The, uh, just very briefly investigating, I mean, lots of adults are, are concerned that there's an underlying tumour with kids, so yeah. it's fair to say that underlying tumours are much less common. We said earlier they're a third of the rate of, of adults. Yeah. The indications for imaging are very similar, mm -hmm. but there are one or two other things perhaps you need to look out for, unexplained deterioration in school work in, in the young. Uh, abnormal behaviour in the young, mm -hmm. but I think the thing to say about imaging is the, the rate of incidental abnormalities is considerably higher in kids, it's up to 20% in some studies, so really imaging is very similar for, for adults, you've got to take the same precautions with the same sort of... Um, yeah, and I think the precaution we're talking about is presenting the pa is, pr is protecting the patient from, from uh, beating their own head against the wall in the sense of finding things that are just going to make everyone paranoid and not help at all. Yeah. If you can make a diagnosis of migraine by getting the family history, by getting all the uh, other things, and you can treat the attacks appropriately, diarise what's going on and see, see improvement, then, and there's a normal examination, then, then imaging has very little to yeah. offer apart from causing problems. And what happens to these kids? Do they grow on to become migraineurs? Typical, uh, my experience is typically as adolescents goes on and they get towards the end of it, it settles down, that settles down and they, 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 I mean, if you buy into the inherited side, they've got the mm. genes, so they're, they're migranous. But the person with troublesome adolescent headache is less bothered by late adolescent, early 20s headache. Mm. And then if it's gonna come back, it tends to recur in the 30s or 40s. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Well, I think that's a good place uh, to stop, Peter. Thanks very much for being with us this afternoon. Pleasure. And um, hopefully um, people have found it useful. Thank you very much. Thank you.